Oh, Generation 2. I think the Johto games are entries in the franchise people are especially fond of, and for good reason. From adding two new types, to introducing shiny Pokémon, to giving us the Kanto region to play through in the post-game, Pokémon Gold and Silver are incredible games in the Pokémon lineup, especially coming off the heels of the super successful Red and Blue. With the improvement to graphics, expansion on game mechanics, and 100 new Pokémon to choose from, Gold and Silver really delivered on the experience fans were wanting out of a sequel. However, even with all these positive aspects, I can't help but find some glaring issues in the roster of newly added Pokémon. Like, glaring issues. Just like my last video, I'm going to go over several Gen 2 Pokémon and tell you why, in my opinion, they're not worth your time and effort. These are the worst Gen 2 Pokémon. If you've watched my previous video, then you'll probably remember what I mean when I say worst. This isn't going to be a list of mons with the lowest base stat totals, but rather more comprehensive reasoning as to why a Pokémon isn't worth using in its debut gen, based on a variety of factors like the ones on screen. There's a number of reasons a Pokémon can be considered bad, and I want to highlight the ones you're less likely to realize are subpar. Another criteria for this list is that I'm omitting version exclusives. There's a point to be made about using a less than perfect Pokémon simply because of its exclusivity. So if you were expecting to see any of these guys on the list, I'm sorry to disappoint. To be fair, the only ones worth mentioning for this list are the Bug Types and Delibird, which I think we can all acknowledge aren't that great. And for anyone wondering why I'm foregoing Pokémon Crystal, I like to make my choices based on the developer's initial release of the gen, mistakes and all. Plenty of Pokémon get revised or updated in the third games, and I don't think the developers deserve this chance to redeem certain Pokémon after the fact. At least for the sake of this video. Not to mention, a majority of Pokémon generations don't have a third game. I'm looking at you, X and Y. Z would have been so easy. With that criteria out of the way, the last thing I wanted to mention was that going into this list, I thought it was going to be much more difficult than the one I did for Gen 1. Not only did we get 100 Pokémon for these games, only two-thirds of what Gen 1 gave us, but we also got the Dark and Steel types, held items, and the extremely important Special Attack and Special Defense split. I figured that these new factors would allow for each individual Pokémon to fill more of a niche, leaving me with little to choose from. However, I was mistaken. If anything, Gen 2 has even more obvious picks for the worst Pokémon, for a lot of reasons. And to not waste any more time, let's get started with the first one of these terrible Pokémon. The symbol Pokémon, Unknown. Be honest, are you surprised? Bad stats, only ever learns hidden power… It isn't even worth spending time on it in this video, let's just move on from here. So to really get into this list, let's talk about the bug and flying type Pokémon, Yanma. One of the many Gen 2 Pokémon that would eventually get an evolution come Diamond and Pearl, Yanma, like many from Johto, is one of those Pokémon where you wonder, what was Game Freak thinking? For one, Yanma is only available on one route out of the whole game, Route 35 between Goldenrod and National Park. That alone isn't so bad, until you realize that you have a 1% chance to encounter it. While you could get lucky, odds are you'll be running around in the grass a while just to encounter it, let alone catch it. It took me 25 minutes of running around just to find one for the video, and that was using speed up. Plus, even if you do encounter it, it only has a 75 capture rate. 75 isn't that low, but it feels weirdly low for a Pokémon like Yanma. Other Pokémon with the same catch rate include Slowbro, Lantern, and Granbull, amongst many others. And I don't know about you, but Yanma doesn't seem to fit in well with this group. Regardless, let's jump into stats. Off the bat, 95 speed is pretty good. And that's the last positive thing I have to say about its stats. Yanma's attack and special attack are mediocre at best, and its defenses at 45 each are just terrible, with HP not helping in that department either. Speaking of defense, Yanma's typing isn't doing it any favors either. Bug and Flying is far from the best defensively with 5 weaknesses, one of which is a 4 times weakness to rock. And in terms of this typing offensively, you might as well just forget about that, because Yanma doesn't get any bug or flying moves in Gold and Silver. In fact, it only gets normal moves by level up, with the strongest one being Swift at level 37. Plus, in terms of TMs, the only non-normal attacking moves it gets are Giga Drain, Solar Beam, and Thief, with Giga Drain being in Kanto and Solar Beam being locked behind the 8th Gym Badge. So yeah, you're probably seeing why Yanma easily made it onto this list. It's extremely rare, and even if you catch one, it doesn't do much of anything for you. If all you can use are normal moves, you might as well just use a normal Pokémon to get the same type attack bonus. Plus, most normal Pokémon get more coverage moves through TM than it can. Yanma is just one of those Pokémon that makes me wonder what the hell the developers were smoking when putting it together. Super rare, subpar stats, horrible move diversity. 
Now I'm wondering if they even intended for us to use it. Maybe that's why they stuck it in a patch of grass that you don't even have to walk through at a 1% encounter rate. Poor little bug. Or should I say, big bug? Jesus Christ, that's huge. Don't worry, Generation 4 will help you out. Let's move on. In a very similar position to Yanma, we have Apom. Yet another case of mediocre now and great later with its Gen 4 evolution Ambipom, Apom has the difficulty of being a normal type in a game with a lot of really good normal types. And it's easy to compare it to something like Miltank to show what it's lacking, but it's even more effective when you can show that inadequacy by comparing it to a Pokemon like Furret. Starting with the biggest issue of stats, when you compare the two, Apom is objectively worse than Furret, with its best feat being a tie in special defense. Furret is faster and stronger, even in special attack, as pitiful as it is. And looking at the move department, Apom doesn't get anything too notable over Furret. While Baton Pass itself can be really helpful, the only thing you can pass is agility, which doesn't really amount to much in an in-game playthrough, at least in non-gimmicky ones. And Apom only gets a handful of TMs that Furret doesn't, none of which are really worth wasting on Apom. Meanwhile, the TMs Furret gets that Apom doesn't are moves like Dig and Hyper Beam, things you would want Apom to learn. So if you're not choosing Apom for stats or moves, then maybe availability? Yeah, you probably already know the answer to that. You can get centered on the very first route of the game, meanwhile you have to wait until you can be taught Headbutt in Ilex Forest in order to headbutt trees to encounter an Apom. By the time you reach this point, the Sentrit from the first route could already be a Furret given its low evolution level of 15, meaning it would outclass Apom the moment you were able to even get one. Out of everything I could find, the only positive I see for Apom is that it's in the fast EXP group, whereas Furret is in the slow one. But that on its own is nowhere near to make up for all of its shortcomings. Similar to Yanma, maybe the developers didn't even intend for us to use it, which is why they confined it to Headbutt Trees, a completely skippable method of encountering Pokémon. But even with all that said, I actually had a great time playing through the game with Apom. I don't know if it was the sprite that rubbed me the right way, but I enjoyed its company. Much more than I did another Pokémon. I'm looking at you, Yanma. Next up on the list is actually three Pokémon, and they are Murkrow, Mischievous, and Houndour. Your initial thought is probably, no, how could you possibly say that these three are some of the worst Gen 2 Pokémon? And you know what? You have a fair point. Not only do these three Pokémon have some decent stats, but Mischievous is the only new Ghost type we received in Johto, and Murkrow and Houndour are both Dark types, one of the two brand new typings to Gen 2. Not to mention, Houndoom is pretty amazing. So why am I talking about them? Well, it's because of their locations. I don't know why, but Game Freak made a really questionable choice in placing these Pokémon. Murkrow is located on routes 7, 16, and 18, Mischievous is located on Mount Silver, and Houndour is located on Route 7 with Murkrow. What these locations all have in common is that they're in the post-game. This decision drives me crazy. We have the brand new generation with only 100 new Pokémon, including our second ever Ghost line and the brand new Dark type that can keep the rulers of Gen 1, the Psychic types, at bay. And what are we going to do with them? We're going to stick them in the post-game. So late into the game that we doubt you're going to bother using them, if you even run into them, that is. It's just such a letdown. Now don't get me wrong, outside of this issue, do I really think that these three are the worst Gen 2 Pokémon? No, not by a long shot. But I do think that they are some of the most mishandled Gen 2 Pokémon. It's not inherently a bad thing to keep a Pokémon locked behind the main story. They gave this same treatment to another Johto Pokémon, being Larvitar, who is also available in Mount Silver alongside Mischievous. But at least Larvitar is the pseudo-legendary of the region, so it's understandable to make the player beat the main game to be rewarded with such an amazing Pokémon. I just can't make sense of it with these three. They're not broken by any means, and it would have been such a great decision to promote these cool new Pokémon early on in the game. But instead, they put it so far into the game that a lot of people probably didn't even see them, especially with Mischievous. Mount Silver is only available after containing the 8 Kanto badges, meaning the only important fight you could use it for is Red. And are you really going to train a Mischievous that far up for one battle? No, probably not. Although, from watching J Rose's Beating Pokemon Crystal Without Experience video, I did learn that Mischievous is perfect for Snorlax, so I guess there's that. I'm interested to see if this issue persists as I go forward with the series of videos. I hope not, but we'll see. And if you've ever used Murkrow, Mischievous, or Houndour in a Gen 2 playthrough, let me know in the comments what it was like. Was it worth waiting all that time for? I'm curious.
Next, let's talk grass types. If you know gold and silver well, then you probably know that Johto isn't very friendly to grass types. They have a disadvantage in all gyms outside of Whitney and Chuck, and the only favorable matchups in the Elite Four are against Will's Slowbro and Bruno's Onyx. Not to mention Team Rocket's plethora of poison types throughout the game. So off the bat, all grass types are in a less than favorable position in the grand scheme of Gen 2. And looking at the grass types we received, I don't think any of them are Pokemon I would label as great. Meganium is easily the worst starter in the game, but it has much better move variety and stats than the other three. Jumpluff is rough, to say the least, with low attacking stats and a less than stellar move pool. Plus, like Yanma, it's a flying type without a flying type move. However, I wouldn't say it's the worst of the three. It has great speed, and with Sleep Powder, it can be quite useful for utility. And most importantly, it's available early, just before the second gym. So that leaves me with Blossom and Sunflora. And they actually end up having the same issue. That's their availability. You're able to catch Oddish and Sunkern fairly early, in Ilex Forest and the National Park respectively. The issue comes with evolving them. To get both Blossom and Sunflora, you need to use a Sunstone. And while this won't be an issue with it being stuck in Kanto like with the last trio of entries, you could argue that this is worse. The only way to obtain a Sunstone is to get first place in the bug catching contest. I could make a whole video on the bug catching contest alone, but I'll make this as short as I can. For those that aren't aware, this is a stupid difficult task to do. The bug catching contest is scored based on a variety of stats from the Pokemon you caught. The maximum possible score is 386 by catching a level 14 Scyther with max IVs in every stat at near full health. And this is where he comes in. <sighs> cool trainer Nick. Nick is an NPC who participates in the bug catching contest, and if you've ever done this contest before, you probably know him as the guy who wins every time without fail. And that's because the minimum number of points he can ever get is 349 meaning you have about a 35 point margin of error to work with. Again, I'm not going to go super in depth on the details as there are better videos out there on the topic, but this is ridiculously difficult to achieve. I had to use save states while getting footage just to ensure I would win, and I used plenty of save states. And the craziest part is that we have all this knowledge of how the mechanics work, and it's still difficult to make happen. Be honest, if you played this game as a kid, did you ever win the bug catching contest? I sure as hell didn't. Especially since you can only do it every couple days, so you can't even try and try again until you got it unless you wanted to save and reset your game constantly. Anyways, let me get back to the topic at hand. Having both Blossom and Sunflora, half of the new grass types introduced, locked behind this big of a wall is absurd. And let's say you do manage to win the bug catching contest. What you're left with is an average Pokemon with basically no type advantages throughout the rest of the game, regardless of what one you choose. These two just got dealt a bad hand. And of the two, I wouldn't say one is significantly better. Blossom is bulkier and a touch faster, Sunflora has better special attack, Sunflora gets better attacking moves like Petal Dance and Sludge Bomb, Blossom gets utility and sleep powder from its pre-evolution. Also, I realized after the fact that I could have taught Sludge Bomb to Gloom and then evolved it into Blossom, so hindsight is 2020. So you're essentially picking the lesser of two evils. I only played through with Blossom, mostly to avoid doing the bug catching contest a second time. And I would venture to say it's a better choice than Sunflora, simply because better defenses and sleep powder are useful in a game where you're at a type disadvantage in basically every battle. But in conclusion, don't use either of these. The bug catching contest factor alone makes these two a lot of work for very little payoff. Now to finish off the list. If you watched the Gen 1 video, then you might remember that Hitmonchan made it onto the list for a variety of reasons. Well, I got a comment on that video from user Fadeleaf, who said, You think Gen 1 Hitmonchan is bad? Try Gen 2 Hitmontop. And... Wow. Were they spot on. Let's talk about why. In Gen 1, you obtain the Hitmons at the Fighting Dojo in Saffron City, midway through the game. In Gen 2, the only way of obtaining any Hitmon is to first get Tyrogue. Tyrogue is available in Mount Mortar, and you can only obtain it after beating the 8th gym as you need to use Waterfall outside of battle to reach it. So off the bat it's pretty late into the game, and completely out of your way as well. But let's say you really want it. So you go deep into Mount Mortar, beat Black Belt Keo, and you're given Tyrogue. And it's level 10. So now you need to train it up since it's so far behind in levels, plus you need to evolve it into your favorite Pokemon, Hitmontop. And here's where it gets rough. Tyrogue has one of the most unique evolution methods in the franchise. 
At level 20, it will evolve into one of the three Hitmons based on its attack and defense stats. Attack higher than defense, Hitmon Lee. Defense higher than attack, Hitmon Chan. Attack and defense exactly the same, Hitmon Top. Precisely managing your stats in Pokemon is a challenge to say the least. Between IVs and EVs, details most casual players would know nothing about, manipulating your stats to exact values is a complex practice. Many veterans still don't bother with these mechanics, especially for in-game playthroughs. I sure as hell don't. But let's say again that you're really determined to get this Hitmon top, and you manage to balance attack and defense perfectly when it evolves. Or hell, maybe you just lucked into it. What kind of Pokemon do you get for your time and effort spent? Well, you get a fighting type whose only fighting attacks are counter at level 31, triple kick at level 49, and rock smash through TM. Speaking of fighting type, let's see how Hitmonchop matches up against the Elite Four, since remember, that's all you really have left in the main story by the time you can even get it. So you have an awful matchup against Will, you're at a disadvantage against Koga, in a neutral position against Bruno, and Karen will end up giving you some trouble and Lance easily destroys Hitmontop. So, not much use there. And it may be decent when you take on Kanto, but anything is good in Kanto, especially with the levels. Apom was even better than Hitmontop in Kanto. This entry is just funny to me, because at a glance, Hitmontop doesn't seem terrible. Its stats are pretty good, and it gets some okay coverage moves, but at the end of the day, it's not worth all the investment. Honestly, if you wanted a really good fighting type, you probably would have went through the effort of getting a Heracross or even the traded Machop from Goldenrod much earlier in the game. Or better yet, you would have let Tyrogue evolve into either of the other options. Both Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan are overall better fighting types than Hitmonchan could even hope to be in this game. Hitmontop, like most others on the list, makes you wonder what the hell the developers were thinking when putting Johto together. I love these games a ton, but they easily have some of the worst offenses when it comes to newly introduced Pokemon. Even though Gold and Silver were incredible in plenty of ways, I can't help but feel like they dropped the ball with a lot of Pokemon. I'm sure there's several others I could have justified putting on here. What do you think should have made it onto the list? Let me know in the comments below! Thanks so much for watching the video, and be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed! I was absolutely shocked at how much attention the Worst Gen 1 video got. I can't tell y'all how much I appreciate the kind words and support on these videos. I'm excited to keep this series going, and as a small thank you for supporting it, I want to talk about some comments I received on the last video, as a lot of y'all made some really good points on other bad Gen 1 Pokemon, as well as on my choices. Even though I didn't talk about it specifically in the video, I used Sandslash as a visual example for a bad Pokemon, sort of on a whim. And after doing that, a lot of you let me know that Marowak is an even worse ground type, and I couldn't agree more. So apologies to the lovers of Sandslash out there, especially one person in particular. I also got several comments on Seeking, as it's worse than Dugong. And I think I agree that Seeking is probably the worst overall water type for a number of reasons, only one of which is that it has the lowest base stat total of all fully evolved water types. So thanks to those who made mention of it. Plenty of people also brought up how I should have given Rapidash more credit for its high crit chance from its high base speed, given that it's Gen 1, and for its fire spin trapping ability. Again, a Gen 1 feature. While I'd still take the stance that Flareon is better, both these trapping moves and higher crit rate due to base speed are integral to Gen 1, so fair point. It's a niche, but a great one at that. And lastly, Farfetch'd. Even though I said Pidgeot is still better than it, I had a lot of you beg to differ, and I low-key agree. Boosted XP from being traded and slashed to almost always crit, Farfetch'd gives Pidgeot a run for its money. I would love to go over comments on Gen 2 in the Worst Gen 3 video, so be sure to give me your takes down below. Thanks again for watching, and be sure to like and sub for more over analysis of Pokemon. Oh, and ring the notification bell if you want. I'm trying to upload every few weeks, but it's easiest if you just get notified when a new video is out. Hope y'all have a good one, and as an extra thanks for making it to the end of the video, here's a picture of my dog. Talk to y'all soon.